the Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. Welcome to the Instructor Podcast. As always, I am your splendid host, Terry Cook, and I'm delighted to be here and even more delighted that you have chosen to listen. This is a show where every week I speak to leaders, experts, innovators, and game changers to look at ways that we can improve your driving school and potentially make an even more awesome driving instructor. And today, as always, that is no different. I am joined by author coach, podcaster, and a general wonderful human being, Dan Meredith. And we're getting into the topic of hard work. Is now the time for driving instructors to work harder, whether that's on your business, whether that's on driving lessons, whether that's on your personal development, is now the ideal time to do that because of the current situation we're in. But before we dive into that, I've got a couple of things I need to make you aware of. First of all, This is the end of season five. Yep, sad to say we are coming to an end. Uh, We'll be back towards the end of the year with season six, but we are taking a break. Now, we won't be going away completely. The Green Wolves will still be out every month. There'll still be a couple of bonus episodes out here and there, but the main podcast, the one you're listening to right now, will be taking a short break. So I am going to suggest that you click subscribe because that way when we come back for season six or if any other episodes drop, you will get them straight into your feed. You do not have to go searching for them. But I'm also going to take a moment to thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. So whether this is the first season you've listened to, whether this is the first episode you're listening to, or whether you've been a listener from day one, I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, especially if you've sent any messages, if you've commented, if you shared with your friends or any colleagues, anything like that. But thank you for listening. It is appreciated. And just a final reminder, definitely take out the opportunity to go and check out the Instructor Podcast Premium while we are away. The content going out will obviously be less. So over at the Instructor Podcast Premium, there will be still content going out over there on top of the 100 plus exclusive trainings we've currently got. And the best place to find that is www.theinstructorpodcast.com. But if you go to the show notes, you'll find a direct link there anyway. So couple of little calls to action for you this Sunday. First of all, make sure you click and subscribe to help you get the future episodes. And secondly, go and check out the premium. We've actually got a free trial available now on the £10 tier, so you can get a free week's trial to see if it's for you. But for now, let's get stuck into the show. So when I started the Instructor Podcast back on season one, I had three very private goals, and that was to achieve five seasons. It was to get an audience of 10% of the industry. I've achieved both of those, and it was to get Dan Meredith on the show. So uh, how are we doing, Dan? You're welcome. I'm glad (laughs) to help you have achieved one of your goals, Mr. T. It's an absolute pleasure. It feels quite fitting that we achieved that goal on the last episode of season five. And this is the season I also hit those four, uh, 4,000 listeners, which is perfect. It's pretty cool. But does that mean that I can now just stop, Dan, and just give up? Yeah, yeah that's it. Now just give up. That's it. Okay. You're done. Yep, no okay. more work. You're finished. Well, thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure. So yeah, that's it. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Um, no, I, I'm going to start off with the same question that I ask everyone, uh, all the guests that come on the show, mm-hmm. which is the, the tagline from this show is that I speak to leaders, experts, innovators, and game changers. And I'm just wondering which one or ones of those do you fall into? Leader, expert, innovator, game changer. Okay. Um, I'll definitely say I'm a leader because I'm in charge of a few sort of decently sized sort of Facebook groups and teams and businesses and stuff. So yeah, without leadership, I'd be pretty screwed. Um, Try and lead by example as well. Um, model I've used is something called servant leadership, which basically means you serve and you lead at the same time. It's not sort of dictatorial. It's kind of, you know, do as I do as well as what I say. So I kind of like to kind of lead by example. Um, Innovator? Possibly. Possibly on that one. Um, I've come with a different approach to entrepreneurship and coaching that I hadn't seen too much prior to me a little bit different um so yeah i would say that one what were the other two again the game changer and expert expert yeah i'm gonna say comfortably an expert i mean i've been 
coaching people now for 10 years, you know, I think it's coming up to three and a half to 4,000 like individuals that I've actually had calls with, whether that's like 15 minutes or work with for years. Um, I've got a good track record. I'm, you know, no one's got a clean sheet, but I'm, um, you know, I'm pretty much up there with my advice is pretty good when people actually listen and do what I say. And said more for humor than anything else. I'm not going to call myself a game changer because I think it's cretinous. I hate, do you know what? It's one of those things. There's phrases in my industry, game changer, the next level, and my all-time fucking favorite, disruptor. Shut up. All right. So I am now going to go and uh, find the disruptive entrepreneur podcast. Listen to delete that and uh, also stop calling myself a game changer. So not in the um... slightest. Listen, <laughs> I'm, listen, my way attitude is you can call yourself whatever you want. But for me, it's one of those ones that because I hear it quite often day to day, I'm just like, oh no, oh no, I can't do that. I mean, the, the one of the things I just want to touch on back there, you mentioned about the 15-minute the coaching calls you do. Mm-hmm. And I was actually listening to one of your podcasts uh, this morning, and you spoke about how you were one of the first people to to start doing that. And I can remember when I sort of joined your world, uh, your paid world in uh, Espresso with Dan, and one of the things that I got at the time was, a, I think it's like an hour call with you. And so I came with my list of questions. And after 20 minutes, you'd answer them all. And I can remember you saying to me, Terry, are you just padding this out? And I'm like, yeah, because I want to talk to you for now. Well, you've covered everything. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think it's like anything, much like probably your job as well. Once you've done it for so long, um, certain things are quite easy. And I've had, obviously, so many people that I've coached over the years. I've got so many of the same problems. And, you know, people are people. We often have the same issues, the same needs, the same wants when it comes to business. There are certain sort of basic principles that, you know, I follow that work, you know, for the majority of people. So yeah, in, in sort of sort of 15, 20 minutes, I can often come to the crux of the solution. And what I found, mate, is a lot of the time people just want to be told what to do. Um, not in a kind of, do as I say, because I'm telling you, it's just a case of we're busy. Our minds are full. We've got loads of other worries. And my job when I, when I sort of coach and mentor people is to try and take some of that pressure off and kind of like, right, well, your brain's full. Let's use my brain. You tell me all the problems. I'll give you the solutions and I'll give you like three to five things to do. Sometimes it's just one or two things. And that's why i've had so many people stay with me for so long because i just keep it simple so right do these two things between now and next week you're good you've moved forward and it's that constant steady growth that i kind of look for for people just before i move in and i start asking you some of the uh the deep intelligent questions mm-hmm. uh there's one thing i want to mention to you because when i was uh, thinking about the the intro for for the show which I, mm-hmm. I do before we record this i was struggling to describe you <laughs> because <laughs> thanks there, there's lots of words that come to mind some of them i don't want to say on this podcast but there's um no i think that when i get people from outside the industry on i like to give more of a thorough description because a lot of the, mm-hmm. the listeners want to come across them and i think a lot of people fit into one box quite comfortably and i don't think you necessarily do so i asked one of your favorite things which is uh, ai uh to describe you uh for anyone that's not seen a video where you should see dan's reaction there was amusing um but i'm going to read you the description and Go i'm on. interested to know your thoughts so i asked ai how would you describe dan meredith to a podcast audience that doesn't know who he is responses dan meredith is a dynamic and influential figure in the world of personal development and entrepreneurship we have a passion for helping individuals unlock their potential dan has built a strong reputation as a motivational speaker author and business strategist no for his high energy and non-nonsense approach he offers practical advice and strategies to overcome challenges to achieve goals and create a successful mindset do you know what ai does do my tits in that's all right but you know what robot overlords who will soon rule us um thank you for that that's, that's all right do you know what? i'll take that one that's nope. not too bad that's not too bad that sounds very polished which is uh as if you know me for RT, it's not my my natural forte is being a polished, um, scrubbed up individual. But yeah, that's do you know what? I'll take that. That's not bad. That's pretty good. I asked it the same question, me, and it did not know who I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. Um, but move, moving on to as at hand, I want to I want to start with quite a, a specific question that's relevant to our industry. Mm-hmm. I, I think you'll have a good take on. Um, so the, the context for for our industry at the minute is. Uh, there's still a massive backlog on driving mm. tests. So people are struggling to book within six months at the minute for their driving yeah. test. 
that has a big knock-on effect to us in that we have a uh, a lot of us have waiting lists most mm -hmm. of us have like full diaries we're not shot on work there's obviously exceptions here and there but the, the bulk of us have full diaries it also has a bit of a negative impact in the sense of someone could be ready for their test three months before the test. Mm -hmm. So they may be wanting to change the way they run the lessons to go for and stuff like that. So, but I think the big thing in terms of a business point, we've got more supply than demand, if you like, or whichever right. way around that is. Yeah. Um, so what would you advise to instructors at the minute to, to make the most situation? We've, we've just got this massive supply of customers. So, and these are people who you can't really serve. You're kind of running out of time at the moment. Is that it? Yeah. So, like I say, we, we've got our current customers that we're working with now. We've mm -hmm. got a waiting list of people, and then we've got people that we're potentially turning away. So how can we make the most of that, do you think? I mean, that is a tricky one because obviously having, you know, worked with you, obviously on the sort of driving test side of things, you know, sort of fiddly it is um, to do so. So one of the things I'm very fortunate that I've got an assistant um, have done for many years. I've got a team of people that work for me, and she joined various. There was um, an automated bot, I think, on Twitter. I think there was. She joined groups. She joined everything. Pay, there was a few paid services. I think they weren't expensive. That sort of like you know gave you like literally immediate you know ready to go appointments as soon as they did. Um, so I was fortunate to grab one in my sort of home city not too long afterwards because she was on it every day now i don't know if that's realistic for people in your world and the thing is there's, there's only really a few things i could suggest is is number one get up earlier go to bed later work weekends there is so look there are times in in my business where you know i'm making you know i'm, I'm doing well okay but there are times where i make do even better and things are really popping off and people are really wanting to invest and it's kind of that whole, you know, make hay while the sun shines. So if if you have the wherewithal drive, energy, sanity to do so, um, especially if you've got, you know, a partner or children or dependents or someone like that, and they sort of understand that you might be, you know, getting up a little earlier, going to bed a little bit later, um, you know, the the sort of commercial side of me would be, get up earlier, go to bed later, work weekends, it would be. But that the downside of that is there will be a point where you'll probably fucking hate your job. So again, you have to be mindful of that. I would say right now, um, if you are pretty full, you've got an abundance of people, the main thing I would say is is just communicate. You know, when I was, you know, because I didn't know you could come down to me and help me out with my situation. Um, because we don't live near each other. And it's an amazing thing you did for me too, which I'm beyond grateful for. But is communicating to people what the situation is and letting them know how you could work with them if they want to pursue things forward. Because I messaged a lot of instructors. Um, I say I messaged, my assistant messaged, and we probably only got a reply from about 50%. So immediately half the people didn't even bother to reply to us. So that person has then, you know, gone to us. And the ones that did, you know, some would just be like, no, too busy right now. There's no appointments for a while, that sort of stuff. But the ones that actually took the time to write a nice message you know it could have been cut and pasted it doesn't really matter just explaining the situation and they gave a solution so like one um chap which i really liked his solution and this is before we worked together he said look because I'm, I'm my sort of person i am i like to just get it done i just want to get it done so he said to me he said look why don't we just do a block of time together get you up to speed really quickly and I said, look, it's, he said, it's probably going to be three or four months till I get you a spot. And then we can just kind of see each other every other week um, to kind of keep you fresh. He said, let's get you up to speed. So a bit of a chunk of work. And then we'll just kind of keep you ticking along until one comes along. And that was probably the best solution that sort of was, was offered to me. And so, yeah, that's something that I have seen, you know, I, I would do personally, you know, get them in, get them good build a good rapport, build a good relationship. And, you know, I'm not saying this in a kind of milk them for more money and do stuff, but, you know, I've done things before. Like I, I learned to ride um, a motorbike in October. Then I got my first, uh, this was many, 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 many years ago. And then I think I got my first bike in the January. So it's three months in between it. And I remember being at the junction wanting to pull out thinking, what do I do? <laughs> so, and I was remembering trying to sort of like feather the clutch out and trying to think to myself, I don't want to accelerate into traffic. 
So again, but if I'd have had a few more lessons, just every couple of weeks, just to kind of tick it along, that would have been good. So that's what I would suggest. You are in a situation which is quite unique. You can't control it. It's government based. You know, you have to wait until they appear. But I would say, you know, having a sort of conversation with, look, here's the situation. So explain the situation. This is what I would suggest if I was you. Let's do, you know, let's get you up to code sort of now. And then let's just kind of keep you maybe every other week. Keep you coming in, keep your skills fresh so that when the driving test actually pops in, you haven't let it all go to waste. Bang, you can go in. So you're ethically getting a little bit of extra money in your pocket. You're not being mercenary and like, yeah, let's just keep this deal one every week until one comes up. I that's the sort of solution I would suggest. I like that. And I think there's a couple of things I want to touch back on. I think first of all, that that the word you use is communication. And I think mm. that's massively important it's something that i do and a lot of instructors do as you said people inquire of us we tell them you know there is this length of time so if they're coming in with that expectation of you mm -hmm. know i'm going to be waiting they, they're not going to be shocked when it when it happens and i'm, I'm going to use the example you put forward as a, a little bit as well of the r test i'm not going to dwell on this too much but mm -hmm. we get a lot of people messaging us saying um i've got my test booked uh can you take me to it i've not had many lessons you know this sort of thing mm -hmm. and i think a lot of instructors are very very dismissive of that and i'm not saying whether they're right or wrong but they'll immediately dismiss it mm -hmm. i always inquire more because for example with yourself you'd been riding a motorbike for years you'd had lessons driving lessons years ago a few lessons so you had this really good kind of foundation already so you weren't ever going to be anyone that needed 40 hours worth of lessons to be ready for a test but yeah. the only way i would know that is so if i have a conversation yeah yeah it's chatting. and there's so always you... people who are naturally good at things you know yeah don't get me wrong and obviously you've told me some horror stories you know i see them i used to see them where i used to live in my old town kind of you know bouncing around the cult you know the sort of streets and stuff which is you know a lot of people start you know not, i'm not mocking anyone it's just you know it's a it's it, it, it doesn't make sense until you until it makes sense until it suddenly clicks but um, yeah, there are people who are, you know, very capable, very confident, actually very skilled. Um, and it's worth having a conversation with. And ultimately, it's always down to you as the business owner, as it's your business, you can you can decide how you want to do it. But if you have the time, and they're willing to pay, and they're down for it, then have a conversation with them. And, the, and, the, and if you want, if you know, that sort of situation, when you get someone like me, who is like, T, I'm not gonna be doing loads of those lessons, I literally just want to do one or two days, smash it that's me as a person that's how i am and obviously i'd had lots of years of experience um riding motorbikes so i was pretty familiar with all the sort of basics of that sort of thing so there's always going to be people who surprise you so if you get someone like that i would say well look let's you know i would tell them book them in for probably one of your dead to spots so like you're not going to you know move a regular around and say look let's do an hour first let's just see how you are if you're actually you know half decent yeah we can do that if not no nope, you need proper time and lessons and investment and all that sort of stuff from experience i know that when we talk about a driving test not to say smash it that's <laughs> cool yes <laughs> but uh but yes the, the the other thing i wanted to just ask you around there because you, you sort of spoke about almost working harder and making hay while the sun shines because at some point this demand is going to drop down a little bit mm -hmm. And I think that there's two ways potentially to do this. I think we've got, as you said, we can throw ourselves into work and earn a crap load of money now, uh, even if you just did it for two or three months to earn a, you know, a bit extra or whatever to cover you for maybe when times drop down a bit. But I think the other side of it is, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, is is using this opportunity to 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 grow or develop your business. Mm -hmm. um, to me, this is a, a perfect opportunity, and I'll, I'll use social media example, to experiment a bit on social media. You know, a lot of instructors, the only social media they'll use is like Facebook and just banging up the past pictures. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's all they'll do. And, and my take on this at the minute, and I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on this, is that use this opportunity to experiment, practice doing video, practice putting up different types of posts and all this kind of stuff uh, for two reasons. One, if it doesn't work very well, it's not going to affect you because you've got Never a full yet. diary anyway. Yep. yep. And two, when that work dies down a little bit, if or when the demand dies down, if if your social media is full of all this awesome content, who are people going to choose? The person with a really awesome social media or someone that just has past pictures so i'd just be interested in your thoughts whether you think this is a good opportunity to do that side of it as well yeah if you didn't want to kind of go down the kind of you know do extra hours take more work on i think that's an absolutely fantastic idea 
I think, and plus as well, if especially if you are, you know, like me and Terry are kind of old hands at social media. I've been sort of posting content for, you know, sort of 10 plus years online now across various platforms. Like I'm pretty good at it, but I wasn't at the start. And my audience wasn't that big at the start. So it's a great place and great time to start because not many people saw it anyway. And if it was shit, well, it was gone within like 24, 48 hours and didn't matter. And it also allowed me when I was quieter um, to figure out what worked, to find my style, to practice being on camera, to practice my audio techniques, to practice you know creating content and memes and images and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, it was a really good time to practice doing that sort of stuff. Plus as well, um, with, I know we've already touched on the whole AI thing, but um, one of the things that, you know, I've sort of been seeing conversations around and I'm, I'm actually a big fan of as well, is that, you know, AI generated content is easy for everyone to do now. I mean, obviously you can edit it up and that. One thing you can right now, and, and even if they did, it's, it's still gonna be stilted for quite a long time, is this, is video is actually like my voice, my face, me talking to it. And ultimately, if there's five people who can deliver me a service, but there's one of those people that makes me smile, I resonate with, fits my personality type, is, you know, someone who I think could not only get me the results, but I'd actually enjoy spending time with, I'm going to work with that person every time. And the thing is, there are people I've worked with who are maybe less skilled at what they do, but they're a fucking joy to work with. And, you know, if I'm spending my time, which is my most precious resource with someone, yes, I want to get a result and I want to get an outcome. But I also want to kind of enjoy that time. I don't want to look forward, you know, look in my diary and dread it and think, oh, fucking hell, I've got to do this thing, even though I know it's important. But, you know, they're a pain in the ass. They drag my energy down. They're moody or whatever. I'm not saying any of your listeners or, or sort of followers are like that at all. But it is a it is a useful thing for people to know who you are and what you're about and stuff. And if you resonate with someone, they're going to work with you. And it's interesting you say that about the, the sort of the moody and grumpy and miserable people because I kind of had a, a little bit of an epiphany around the podcast recently in, in that I think I was putting too much focus on those people and trying to win those people over. And I suddenly realized, why am I worrying about them so much? I want to work on the audience that I've got. I need to mm. engage with these guys because these guys have come to me because I am – being this kind of positive and outgoing and you know providing them with this 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 quality that we're doing today for example so they're coming to me because of that so they're the people mm. I want to speak to and i think if you put yourself out there on social media especially in video but even if it's written posts or whatever and you're using your personality you're going to attract the the right people are you correct yeah 100 yeah. percent, mate and i think that when we Again, going back to the what instructors can do now, I think that if you're doing that stuff on social media and you're putting yourself out there, you're going to get more students that will suit you. So you're not going to get people coming to you that you dread yeah. being in the car with. But exactly, uh, I've spoke about that quite a bit previously, so I'm going to detail back from that. That's a all right, bit. mate. I, I want to come back to the, the the hard work, the going all in, goes baldy that that side mm -hmm. of it, because. I've asked you this before, and, and I liked your answer to it, so I kind of want to put this out there to, to the listeners as well, because there are a lot of instructors that are working really hard at the minute, and part of that is because people find it difficult to say no, because, mm -hmm. as we say, we I've had, I think, counted this morning, I think it was 12 messages this week from people asking for lessons. Wow. And it Good is horrible saying no. Yeah, it's not nice, because it, mm. I've got people coming to me saying their instructors let them down, or whether they have or not. You know, you know, that's yeah. a discussion we'll have. But so I think the first question I want to ask around that is how do you learn to say no? Because it's really easy or really easy to be that yes man. How do you learn to say no to people? I mean, one of the things, I mean, I used to be a chronic yes man. I'd say yes to anything. I'd say yes to um, doing extra work, staying later, doing things that were part of my duties when I was in a more employed or kind of, you know, someone was paying me to do stuff. I would... You know, people want me, and again, not this one, obviously, but I'd be like, so like, can you come on my podcast? Can you come on my group? Can you do this? When I got a bit of sort of notoriety, and I'd be like, yes, 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 because I wanted to. And I just said yes without thinking, I don't want to let people down. But what happened is, is that I found myself getting more and more tired. I got a little bit jaded. I got a bit resentful. Um, I didn't even want to fucking reply to people after a period of time, which is not me. That's not me. That's not my attitude. That's not my energy. 
So for me, boundaries is key. So I'm very, very clear with my boundaries. And, you know, even, you know, Terry, I class you as a friend. You've been a wonderful person. You've helped change mine and my family's life. But even when we were arranging this podcast, it was very much a case of these are the specific times I've got. That's what I can do. Can you work around it? And that's not being an arrogant sort of thing. It's just I'm very, very structured with my boundaries, my rules, my disciplines, my time slots and all that kind of stuff because it keeps me sane. Because I always want to do the best whenever I'm doing something. And I know if I'm doing something on a day for a person at this time, I know that that is actually me giving my best rather than just doing it because I said I'd do it. Um, I would just say uh, a big thing is would be sort of, I would say, you know, so that I would actually sort of empathize to start off with. So if you get that sort of situation, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, that's a real shame. You know, unfortunately, like in any industry, that does happen from time to time. Um, however, I'm afraid right now I am currently full. Um, you're so, you know, and then you could also sort of segue into saying something like, I would like to help you, but this is the situation in the industry right now. Um, it's going to be a month or so before I can get you in. If you're happy to wait, I'm happy to book someone in in the future. But if not, here's actually a few recommendations of people that I know in the area that might be available too. So that's how I would, you know, again, a bit on the fly there, T, but that's how I would structure a response back to someone if I had to say no. Acknowledge them, empathize, let them know what you can do, and also offer them a few other solutions. That would be if someone sent me that, that's lovely. I think that solutions is key. You know, it's something that, that I've done before as well is that send resources. You know, I can't help you, but here's my five minute free podcast. I can't help you, but you've told me you're nervous. Here's the Confident Drivers podcast or whatever. It doesn't have to be something you've done, does it? Correct. You know, they don't necessarily know that. They're not bothered. They're just, oh, this guy's nice. And yeah. if, if you know, six months down the line, someone asks them to recommend a driving instructor, there's a chance of recommending you rather than the person they went with. Exactly. Um, and and the other thing I just want to ask you about, because you, you said this to me uh, quite a while ago, actually, um, and it stuck with me, resonated a lot, is that if you're saying no to someone, so whether that's driving lessons or, you know, life thing or whatever situation mm -hmm. it is, you can just say no. You don't have to justify that no. It's well within your rights to say no. That's something that really felt uncomfortable to me. Can you just expand on that a little bit? So somewhere? there's a little, it's not mine. Um, yeah. And there was a whole concept of saying no and yes to things and it was saying saying no without excuses and say yes to things just because now that may seem like a bit of an oxymoron but many of us when we say no we say no or no thank you and then we kind of put in this and in this instance you know i i would probably lean more towards my first sort of answer that i said because it is you know especially when you're self-employed in a in a regional setting if you come across as an asshole that will get out, okay? So that's what I would do. But for me, I I used to say, no, oh, because I've got to do this, because, and I'd, I'd start to justify it. And honestly, sometimes I get things offered to me, things suggested, and I said, oh, no, no, thanks, you're good. I'm all right, thank you. Don't just, it's practice on that one. But the yes side of that is more to things like experiences or trying something new or thing that may be not scared of, but I'm a little bit like, oh, that's not, really me but that could be interesting let's say yes to it so i say yes to stuff that might help me grow as an individual that might allow me to experience something different experience you know somebody else's perspective of life or learn a new skill something i've never done before because i don't know it until i try it. i might fucking love it I might love it um but equally i might try something and think do you know what that's not for me, but at least I've given it a go now. But yeah, it's, it, it's a practice thing. Um, you can do it politely, you can do it calmly, and it's just, again, goes back to that sort of boundary conversation. If it's something that doesn't serve you, it takes you away from your goals, it is more for someone else, as in they want you to do it for, for them rather than any, you know, major benefit to you. And obviously I'm excluding things like friends and partners and stuff because that's, you know, we all help each other out there. But yeah, it, it, it's a practice thing. You just kind of say, no, thank you, I'm good. And that's a nice segue into something else I want to speak about, which is the idea of development and trying new things mm -hmm. and growth. And it's it's interesting. My dad always used to say that uh, you should always try something twice because you might not like it the first time, but you might the second. And that's why he's got two kids. Um, but he, um, I want to start off actually with this because your book, um, How to Be Fucking Awesome, uh, I'll put a link for that in the show notes. Uh, I just want to recommend it before. I recommend everyone listening checks it out. 
Uh, I've said this to you before. I don't know if I've said it to the listeners, so I'll say it again. Okay. It's one of only three books I've read more than once. Uh, it's yours, 15 Minutes of Happiness by Richard Nichols and How to Be a Badass by Jen Sincero. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're my three go-to books if, if my head's in a bit of a funk. Um, and one of the things you say repeatedly in that book, and I think this is what first really endeared me to you, is you talk about in there that if someone just wants to work a nine-to-five job and they're happy with their life doing this nine-to-five job and what they do after, then that's fine. That's great. They know what they want. They're happy doing it. No problem. Mm -hmm. That was really, really refreshing for me to hear when I first started getting into this industry, um, the sort of professional development side of it and personal Mm -hmm. development, because no one says that. Everyone says you have to be more. You have to be better. You have to do this. And one yeah. of the things that sort of really resonated with me is I remember reading a post, and this is back in my early days, and it stuck with me. People basically slagging off people who had a job and did that sort of, you know, that nor let's just call it the more traditional and from a societal standards point of life. And I was like, well, my mum had a job and my dad had a job. They had two kids, they had a house, they had a car. That's kind of a traditional path for a, for, for a big chunk of people. And I was like, you slagging off my mum and dad? I'll fucking chin you. Um, and it's just kind of really, I found it really insulting because a lot of these people who are in these sort of spaces actually had parents who did have jobs and, you know, worked and stuff. And it's like, like for me, I realised that, you know, because of my, I mean, just a quick summary for everyone listening, I've got our heavily disabled little sister. Part of the reason I went into sort of entrepreneurship is I could, I, I earned a really good income working really, really fucking hard. Long hours, early starts, late finishes, weekends, you know, I I was doing very well, but I was also absolutely toast. So I realized that I needed to go into something different to be able to earn the revenue I needed to keep my little sister safe, you know, in the future, make sure there was an abundance of pennies available for her care and her sort of health and treatment and stuff. So I was happy to take that risk, but I was also in a situation where I could take that risk, you know, I was single when I started it, but then I ended up having a partner for a long period of time who was very supportive. Um, I also had a skill set I could fall back on. I was in, you know, I was very, very successful in recruitment, had my own company in that for a period of time, in sales, in in marketing. So I'd always be able to fall back into something. And obviously, I'm, a, you know, just the nature of who I am from years of doing this, very good networker very good at creating opportunities out of nothing. Like literally, it, I mean, I remember once when I lost everything, and this is when I was 27, um, I had to print off CVs uh, in the middle of the heat wave of that year and take multiple undershirts and shirts. And I, I old school, because I didn't have enough money to even get on the tube, I had to walk around London, old school, doorstepping, knocking on doors and handing in my CV. And I eventually, you know, did work. But I'm not afraid of of doing those sort of things. So sometimes, and some things I say to people is, is you know, especially in the sort of entrepreneurship space that I'm in, the best thing you can do right now is get a job. Make sure your bills are paid. Make sure your mortgage is paid. Make sure there's food on the table. Make sure you're supporting your partner, yourself, whoever. Okay, let's just get you stable. Let's get a nice, stable base. Then we can see what we can build once we've got you settled. So there is nothing wrong with that. And if you're listening and you just say, you know what, Dan? I want to just do 15 lessons a week and have the rest of the time off. Fucking fantastic. Sure, life. It's, live it how you want. Exactly. I think it's great. I think if someone is happy doing that, they've achieved their goal in life. They're just mm-hmm. happy with life. It's brilliant. But I think with this this podcast, I think the listeners to this podcast, that they listen and they want to develop. Now, they may want to develop in terms of becoming a better instructor. They may want to mm-hmm. develop in terms of running a more um smooth business that may want to develop in branching out the business into other areas into different forms of coaching or to you know create classes and all this kind of stuff so the people that listen are looking to develop in one way or another awesome what i come across a lot is people that are scared and, and okay. i've been in this boat so i'm going to ask you from that perspective if someone maybe they've got an idea of what they want to do but they don't know where to start. They're too scared to start. How, how can I go on social media and say I've done a thing? What do you say to those people? Right. So is this someone with something or without something? Because I've got a slightly different answer depending. Is this someone with an idea, maybe? Do both. Do both. Okay. I'll do the idea one first. Yeah. All right. This is going to sound really basic and really patronizing and really fucking simple. Google it. 
Okay, I'm going to give you an example from my life. I have a business. My brand is called Coffee with Dan. Um, no logic behind it. I woke up one morning. I used to drink. Um, don't drink any alcohol. Anymore. Nothing wrong with it. If you enjoy a drink, fucking fantastic. I still have lots of drinks in my house that I dish out to others. That sounds really dodgy when you say that out loud. But what I mean is, is that I've got you know, I've it's, it's a personal choice for me to to stop drinking. But when I was drinking, I was probably drinking a little too much, and I thought. I'll just have this Facebook group and I'll show up every morning. I'll teach. So basically you keep me accountable because if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. I will stop me getting pissed the night before. So, and then I'll teach you things that I've learned from building all the agencies and all the marketing stuff I did. And so it's called coffee with Dan. And I remember someone saying to me, not super long ago, last year, why haven't you got a coffee? And I'm like, yeah, that's actually a fucking good point, actually. Probably should have some coffee. And I don't know jack shit about a coffee business. So I went on to Google, how do you start a coffee business in the UK? That's it. And then I looked at the research. There were some medium articles. There were some videos and stuff. Then there's a list of companies that did it. I emailed 10, four came back, had a conversation with all four. One of the guys I just really fucking like, we just got on like a house on fire, kind of touching what I said earlier. And then as of recording this week, I launched my coffee. We've sold hundreds of bags already. Um, people actually love it, which is nice. It actually tastes nice and people think it's brilliant. But that's what I started with it, with a Google search and thinking, right, okay, how do I do it? And just starting doing it. And the next thing was just to put it out there. Like with no, there's no guarantees of success. Okay. So if you've got the thing already, um, you need to learn how to market the thing. So I will say learning the basics of sales and marketing, both, you know, verbally via the written word, copywriting, sales techniques, social media marketing, like this sounds like a lot, but there are, you know, there are paid resources. And, and the reason I suggest paid first, if you have the penny spare is because what you invest in you kind of tend to put more weight into doing it. So there's this kind of, you know, a lot of people don't value free as much as they should, which is silly because there's one, there's like literally there's the, everything you possibly need is at your, is at your thumb tips. Okay. You just type it in and find the answer to pretty much anything you need. But if, you know, money is a little tight, resources a little bit tight, there are free resources in there. And then the investment is going to be your time and energy. So that's the equity that you're going to be putting into that. But when it comes to like overcoming the fear side of things, um, my, I kind of touched on this earlier. Most people are just kind of concerned about their own shit. They're worried about their own problems. They've got their own issues, their own wants, their own needs. Like to really give too much of a shit about you doing your thing. And this is it. I'm I'm very fortunate that I have worked with thousands of people when I've been like at the start of some people's, you know, stupendous careers. And I'm so proud that, that I was sort of, sort of like the spark for a lot of these people who've now gone on to achieve amazing things. You don't know how things are going to work until you put there. I met a chap, um, a mastermind I did. He was earning, say, about four grand a month. And I, and I hope that doesn't sound facetious, but in entrepreneurship, that's, you know, that's kind of okay. Sort of like, you know, you're doing all right. He was doing some copy and building some funnels, which are like sort of automated marketing systems. And he was one of the most talented, charismatic people. And I was just kind of like, you are playing so, so you know, I shredded him shredded him and then i saw we're still friends um he came to see me in brighton when i used to live there and he was doing well um and he turned that business so that conversation he had he decided to go and partner up with someone and launch a sort of coaching supplement kind of combination thing in the fitness space and he he did a, he did a hardcore version and he basically he had a relationship that was just kind of a, it wasn't going anywhere so he ended that he cancelled his direct debits to everything. He literally turned his spare room into a gym and he only left his house twice a day to go for a walk and get food. That's it. He did that for nine months and he made a million dollars. I just saw an update from him the other week. Thought, oh, you look like you're somewhere nice. Yeah, he owns pretty much Germany's biggest independent payment processor now. He, he has no knowledge. In fact, you know, he obviously decided, fuck it, that's, I see an opportunity there. I'm going to go for it. So... That fear, that worry is just holding you back from a future that could be absolutely fucking fantastic. Okay. But also, much like you said about the try things twice, I've done plenty of things. Oh, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I want to launch that. I want to try it. I did it and I was like, oh, this is a bit shit. I don't want to do this anymore. And obviously, I didn't just 
get, you know, cancer. So I sort of like wrap those things up and stuff. But it's a case of it's that whole regrets thing. Um, do you want to kind of, you know, wrap up your life wishing you'd have tried things, wishing you'd have put something out there? Honestly, you, you're going to regret more of the things you don't do than the ones you do. And that's what I've learned from having, you know, years of just going like, oh, fuck it, putting myself out there and seeing what happens. And you know, yeah, I've made mistakes. I've screwed up. Things haven't gone to plan. I've lost money on stuff. But they are massively um, outweighed by all the things that's gone right. And, you know, the book in itself, Terry, I, people kept asking me to do it. And I was like, oh, can't be asked. You know, no one's going to want to read a book from me. I don't know how to write a book. So I did the same thing. Posted on Facebook. Does anyone know how to write a book? Someone tagged someone in. That person then became, you know, a friend. He's now my publisher. He came up with the the hook for the book. And I was like, right. And I just sat down, wrote it in three and a half days after a day's planning. My goal was to sell 500 copies. I printed off 500. I put a big event on. But we're a million plus now. Like, it's insane. So, again, you don't know until you put things out there. But honestly, it's a cheesy cliche saying. You probably heard. But all the good stuff you want is on the other side of fear. It really is. Anyone listening, uh, press pause, uh, rewind back five minutes and listen to that again several times because there's loads of of gold that you can take <laughs> away from that. I mean, the whole episode, obviously, but those last few minutes in particular. Oh, uh, and, and a few bits I want to touch back. In fact, I'm going to give my perspective on something you've said there because you were talking about trying stuff and regrets and that side of it. And, and, and on a personal note, um, every listeners probably know, I've said it a, a couple of times, but my marriage ended last year. And for a while, I'd been looking back on that with regret you know it was like oh mm. wasted nine years that kind of thing and fairly recently i suddenly realized that's complete and utter bollocks i had an awesome marriage for nine years that's mm-hmm. not a failure i had a brilliant nine years that then ended now yeah, i'm off to really do something reframe. else that's exciting and I, I just think that we look at we worry about stuff that actually only affects a really tiny proportion you know it's like one bad month compared mm. to nine awesome years yeah but it's a lovely way of looking at it mate. i also want to touch back on what you said about um paying for services development that kind of stuff because that's summer in our industry and i'm sure it's the same in every but obviously i'm entrenched in, in mine that that's a real touchy subject you know there was a i, I did a, an expert session recently. I got someone in to do it for my premium content, and it was like twenty quid. Uh, I forget how much it was for for the for this session. And someone commented and said that I should increase the price of lessons for my students so that that can be delivered for free. And and that's to instructors. That's we should awesome. never charge. In- <laughs> should Sorry. never charge instructors for anything. That's kind of the mentality of some people, but. What you said there about paying for stuff, it reminded me of a statistic that I, I come across recently on my podcast in particular. So this this free podcast, everyone listens now, mm-hmm. the average completion rate is 62%. So 62% okay. of people listen all the way through, which is actually really good for a podcast, but 62%. Awesome. For my paid account, it's 97 So the people that are paying for stuff mm-hmm. listen pretty much all the way through, pretty much all the way time. Beautiful. But the people that are... I'm paying for it, dip in and out. And I think that's kind of almost a perfect example of what you were saying. So what would you say to people that are taking that, that we kind of said it, fuck off, but you know, what do you say to people that are taking that approach, you're belittling people that are creating a service, creating a product and have the audacity to charge for it? I mean, it's more of a reflection on them. I mean, sometimes it is just, you know, look, I'm, I know I sort of joking went just, oh, fuck off. That's just me being sort of silly in that situation. I'm sure that person is absolutely lovely. Is sometimes, uh, okay, then, <laughs> okay, that's well, do you know what? That's that covered. Look, sometimes people are just having a bad day, okay? Sometimes people do just leave spicy comments, shitty things, say stuff that they want to say because they're not feeling fab that day. That's okay. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. We've all done it. We're human beings. Um, if you are creating something that can add value to someone's life, you are more than within your right to charge for it. If you've spent time and money and energy mastering that, learning that, getting skilled at that, and you're going to condense that and say, look, I've done this for several years. Here's how I could, you know, in this instance, let's just say how I could get a a average, no social media, no big following, no big friendship group, just a normal person. Okay, from naught to 20 clients, you know, with a, you know, in a driving instructor business within three months or less, you know, I've told, you know, I can tell you exactly what to do, how to do it, 
kind of things you need to share, where you need to go, things you need to say. That's worth money. Like you've done the hard work, you've put the time and the energy in and the resources in and stuff. And if you've got something that you want to put out there, then yeah, you should you should be paid for it. And one thing I will say, which is kind of a bizarre thing as well. Um, and again, this is not me saying putting prices up, charge loads. You know, I have a selection of, you know, my my private client work is is a premium, you know, consultant stuff, you know, that but that's based off of me doing this for 10 years. Okay, so this is, you know, a time served thing. But I've got products and services at all ranges. You know, I pay to have a free group run. I pay someone to help me edit and put out free content. You know, I I happily do that. That's my sort of giving back and helping. And then I've got, you know, products and services at all different layers, depending on where you're at, you know, from books to, you know, working with me one to one over a few days. It's, It's up to you. But you have every right to earn from your experience and skills if you can actually get a you know desired outcome for that person. So if you can teach them something, if they can master something, learn something, get the head in a better place, you know whatever it is that they're looking to sell, you are allowed to charge for it. And if somebody doesn't like it, that's okay. That's their opinion. They're allowed to not like it. They're allowed to say, I want this for free. Cool. Do you know what? That's fine. Why don't you pop onto YouTube? See what you can find there. Google it. See what comes up. Follow some other instructors. See what they teach you. But for me, with this product or service or thing that I'm doing, this has a cost with it because I've put all this time and energy and effort into learning this so you don't have to. Or you're welcome to do the journey that I did, which will take you years and years and all this time and effort. I'm literally providing you a shortcut for a price. Not unfair at all. Do you know what? I'll use one of your motor. I'll use I'll I'll, I'll flip to a, a motoring analogy. Yeah. You know, you've got the toll road. Yeah. Probably sure some people get pissed off with them. But there's a there's a toll road. If I'm going up north and stuff, I can take the route that is free. I can take that route. It's another half an hour or so, and it has to go through more traffic. Or I can pay a few pounds, and I can take the speedy one that gets me where I want to go quicker. That's my choice. I'm choosing to take the faster option, but to get that faster option, I've got to give a few quid. Okay, I'll do that then. I've also done it the other way around where I, I now love driving. I've got a lovely car. It's like driving a big sort of comfy cold sofa that plays my music. So I, I've done that journey a couple of times and not done the toll road because I actually was just happy and enjoying the journey. I was like, yeah, I don't care if I'm in here for another half hour. I've got another great mix coming up. I'm awesome. But it is horses for courses. You know, that's it. That's the best analogy I've ever today. You're welcome. Um, no, oh, merely it's quarter to ten, but I think it's going to yeah. be the best analogy I hear today. Uh, I like that. That resonated. Um, all right, so a couple of curiosity questions to finish mm-hmm. with then, and I hope this first one's okay, because you mentioned about uh, stopping drinking there. Yeah. I mean, you stopped drinking for different reasons. Um, I stopped drinking because I couldn't manage the hangovers the next day. <laughs> I'd be, I'd lose a day off two pints. It were ridiculous. Oh, man. Um, that's the Gilbert syndrome thing. Anyway, um, I was just wondering how people reacted after that and the reason i ask that just put a tiny bit of context on that is i was i put off stopping drinking for ages because i assumed that everyone would think i was just this massive loser because mm-hmm. you know vegan don't drink what do you do for fun you know sort of thing yeah and my brother uh is a wonderful human being but he's a he's a he's a bloke you know yeah. you think of a bloke he's, he's a, a bloke. manly man yeah. he's a manly man very much so and um when I told him I was stopping drinking, I was expecting him to be like the, at the forefront of the, the negativity. And he just went, oh, cool. Nice one. I'll get you a cook. And I'm like, Where, where's where's the yeah. negativity? I was almost disappointed it wasn't coming. So I was just wondering uh, for anyone out there, maybe is considering stopping drinking for any reason. You know, how, how did you find it afterwards in terms of people's reaction? Yeah, to- I had a few similar thoughts to start off with, but I'm also... Probably you can probably sum up from this podcast. I'm quite happy to do what I want to do. And I don't, I obviously care about people and their opinions. And if they're close to me, if they're paying me money, if they've been in my world, you know, I will listen. But ultimately, I'll do what's right for for me. And when, you know, I tried uh, moderation, did quite well with it for a period of time, then had a really stressful period and the moderation became fun time. So I just thought, you know what? It's just not serving me anymore. And it was no, I wasn't beating myself up. I didn't think I was uh, a waste of space, useless. I said, you know what? Benefits aren't really there for me anymore. And I had the opposite. I've never had a hangover. 
So I've been sick because I've drunk too much for, but I've never had that. You know, usually I get up, I'm ready to go regardless. I, I could have an hour's sleep and I'm like, cool, off I go. Um, so I never had that kind of negative feedback loop. But for me, I was just starting to feel a bit more sluggish. I was looking like shit. Um, I felt, you know, just lethargic, you know, my body wasn't doing the things it used to do. And I thought, you know, and I, and I, and my thinking wasn't as clear as it was. And I thought, you know what, I've got this great opportunity here with my business. And obviously sometimes, you know, when we've had a few drinks, we say silly things. And I thought, you know, one big night, one silly comment, one silly, I think, you know, I could, I could scupper this. And I thought, yeah, I'll just stop. And I had absolute for me personally, um, because I was drinking quite a bit. The first few days actually were quite hard because my body was just so used to it. It's like, where is the alcohol? Where is the sugar that you've been giving me? And after that, it's been fine. And I, I've just told people it's just something I don't do. And I will say right now, I mean, drinking is a big part of British culture. You know, I thought I wouldn't be, you know, I, I did have some friendships which were solely based around drinking and they fell by the wayside. Um, nothing wrong with them. It's just the case if we realized that's all we kind of really had common was going out and getting a bit fucked up. So when I stopped doing that, we didn't re- we re- I realized we didn't actually have as much common as I thought. But honestly, quite frankly, now I'm really useful. I can obviously pick people up and take people places. I have a clear head. I can go out more often, if that makes sense, because there's no negative side effect. I can actually go to pubs and bars and, and places because I'm not drinking. Plus, as well, the other side of things is, since I stopped, there's been a proliferation of, like, I get bored of probably like you do, of just having, you know, the Cokes and the soft drinks and the sweet drinks. There's, like, all these low-alcohol or non-alcohol beers and spirits. Like, there's an amazing cocktail bar in the town where I live, and they have this whole range of cocktails and they're amazing and they do taste you know they've got an alcohol tang to it so i still feel like i'm having a grown-up drink but i I used to love a cocktail for example and i can now sort of join in with everyone else no one again once you've told people now i'm not doing it there's a few people who tried to make me go go on have a drink and stuff like that and i'm just like nah you're good a couple of people tried um not malicious but when you look back you think yeah you know it's a bit shitty doing that but no, it's been absolutely no problems. I'll just say if you, you know, enjoy a drink and love a drink, fantastic. But if you ever want to stop it, you can. Like it's your life. This is one thing I'm a big believer in. It is your life. You can, you know, if you're not harming anyone, um, do what the fuck you want. I'm still in a line from you here. Uh, what do you do for fun? Nah, to be fair, it's um okay. So I mean, a lot of my sort of fun is is around physicality. So um, I like to I like to lift weights. I like to box. I like to race motorbikes. I like to do. I like to go fast, not on public roads, but I like anything. Like I like jumping out of planes. I like the podcast. Yeah, to no, no, but, yeah, but I like jumping out of planes. Yeah. I like doing track days. I like doing kind of like anything with speed, like racing jet skis, like all that sort of stuff. But honestly, mate, day to day, like I mean, that's the kind of external me. But internal me, I'm like, I've got, you know, just to look. Obviously, for those of you listening, can't see. I was just looking over my shoulder at my big unnecessarily large telly which i love and i've got all the game systems around it you know i love my gaming i'm an absolute warhammer nerd i love reading warhammer fiction i'm a sci-fi geek i mean i've watched every single aliens films multiple times even the shit ones like aliens versus predator 2 i still watch even though i hate it it's principle but you know anyway so i love my sci-fi i love um obviously i love my family as well spend time with my mum and my sister um yeah, I just I just enjoy life, mate. And I just kind of, you know, outside of that food, I'm an absolute food fiend. And probably that's why I have to train so much because I am an absolute devil for a tasting menu. That's my favorite thing to do. The reason I asked those couple of questions, or part of the reason I asked, is because I, I want to finish on a bit of a compliment. Um, oh. Same way I started, I kind of. Um, in that, I think it's really refreshing you know you are one of the most successful people i know you're one of the coolest people i know you are one of the nicest and most giving people i've come across and yet when you look at the stuff you've just described there you don't drink anymore mm-hmm. um warhammer sci-fi you look at that stuff and what that in society is is kind of associated with i think that to me is something that i've always aspired to in that well, if if Dan, if people like Dan Meredith and a mutual friend, I'm going to give him a shout, Robin Bates, you know, yeah, if these Robin... type of people that are really successful and really awesome people, but are more than willing to go out and say, I love Warhammer, I love sci-fi, you well, know, that kind of love stuff. It. Exactly. Then I can, you know, and I think that the more people that do that, the better. Um, ah, that's nice, mate. But you can, though, mate. And it's like, you know, a lot of the stuff, I'm, I say this to people, it's like, think about the stuff you used to love when you were a kid that you let go of because you didn't think it was cool or you become a teenager. And it's like, a lot of the stuff I love from being a 
little boy that I used to love doing. Like I love, yeah, I'll tell you one thing. This is something for you, Terry, that you wouldn't be expecting. I love nature, love nature, loved animals. I had, I used to be in Cubs and I won my collector's badge because I had 132 books on animals and insects and plants. I just fucking loved it. So I love nature. I love all that sort of stuff. And I looked on an app, which is local to where I live. And it was like ten pounds, and to do this activity, and that activity was foraging. And I thought, I looked at that, I thought, I want to fucking forage. And it's but honestly, I could not have stood out more, Terry, if I tried. You know, I'm fairly well built, a bit more louder, obviously, big bearded, tattooed bloke, and it was loads of let's just say very lovely, sweet, slightly like alternative types. In wait a great time, I got all kind of fucking berries and shit. It was awesome. I had a brilliant time, but foraging. Cannot recommend it enough. I you weren't expecting that, were you? No. And and I put a lot of time and thought into the titles of my podcast, but this one is going to be called I Want to Fucking Forage. That's that. No, do you know what, Terry? Because just because I'm gonna give you a suggestion, right? There's all kind of weird kinky shit people are into online. I just have a feeling foraging might also mean <laughs> something else. So I don't know. And that's not me getting into some other dark things that I'm into already that are weird shit. But again, if you're into weird shit, fucking fill your boots, rub what you want to rub. But that aside, maybe pivot on that one, Mr. T. I typed uh, Rufinol into Google the other day because I wanted to find out how to spell it and then immediately regretted typing that in afterwards. But either way, you live and learn, as the police told me. Um, the last question I want to fire at you is uh, yeah. probably the most important question of the day. What is the ultimate driving song? What am I adding to my Spotify playlist for the Instructor Podcast? Oh, yeah, bastard. And it's a question that catches everyone out. Ah, let me have a ponder. Oh, do you know what? I'll tell you one. And look, if you can't see, I'll see if I can do it with the camera for those. See, my hairs are just stood up on the end. Okay, remembered one song. It's called Gratitude by Above and Beyond. Okay, it's not so much. I don't know if it's a drop, but it will make you think. It's a nice, but it's like I'm a big fan of EDM and kind of like trance and house and stuff like that. But the lyrics to it are beautiful. So, is it a driving song? I, I, if I was going to go drive, I was thinking like Prodigy and Metallica and some of the other bands that I'm into, but I'm thinking a song to, you know, when you're having that, do you know what? You know, when you're having the drive, when you're having a think, it's for that one. Cool. Uh, I'll get that added to the list. And uh, do you want to just finish up by telling people where they can find you? And maybe uh, the best place for like the introduction to the world to Dan, whether that's the book or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. Yeah. Um, put my name in, Dan Meredith, into Amazon. You'll find my book. And you'll also find my dad's book on there. My dad passed away a few years ago. So I wrote uh, his book on his behalf. So you can have a look at those, see what I'm about. Um, go on to Facebook, Coffee with Dan. Literally search that in groups. Feel free to join. Um, at the real Dan Meredith on Instagram or just titri titrally, that's not a word. Literally just type my name into Facebook, give me a follow, give me an ad request. Um, yeah, I'm I'm very open. I put different things in different places. So each each medium is different. And I also have a podcast with my friend Jay called The Body and the Beast, if you want to listen to some more of me, which is more sort of personal development and business stuff as well. Well, uh, you'll find links for all that stuff in the show notes and highly uh, recommend the podcast in particular but Thanks, all that's mate. left for me to say is uh, thank you for joining me today Dan it's been an absolute pleasure thank you and I appreciate it to all of you that listened I hope you got some value from it and yeah thank you for your time So a big thank you to Dan Meredith there you heard at the start of the show Dan was someone I've wanted on for a long time Really pleased to get him on. We've spoke about him coming on a few times in the past, but dates have never just married up. Well, we're both quite busy, probably Dan more than me, to be fair. But uh, it was great to have him on. Loads of insight. Really enjoyed that. And, and in honesty, at the perfect way to end season five. I also said at the start of the show, thank you. I want to take a moment to do that again. Thank you for listening. If you listen all the way to the end of this podcast, you go into the elite listeners section. You are in the elite listeners club. I'm going to get some badges made up, actually. So if you ever see me, you can tell me, Terry, I'm an elite listener. I listen all the way to the end and I can give you a badge. Um, that's that's going to come in the future. That's a new idea. I've said that, said that for the first time now. Oh, dear. Making pledges that I might not be able to stick to. Either way, uh, thank you for listening. It's very much appreciated. I'm not quite sure what the future holds for this podcast in terms of structure and content, but we will be back with season six before the year is out. 
But I do just want to take a final opportunity to remind you to go and check out the Instructor Podcast Premium. It's a place where you can take your CPD, your personal development to the next level, whether you're looking for stuff around mindfulness, around mental health, you're looking for ways to improve your business, you're looking for driving instructor-specific training, whether you want to come and see the expert sessions that we do, whether you want to come to my problem sessions, problem solver sessions, where you get to come and pick my brains for three hours, four times a month, whatever it is you want, it's going to be over there. Uh, so go and check it out, www.theinstructorpodcast.com. There is currently a free trial on the £10 tier. I can't quite implement that on the, the higher tier yet, simply because of it's more of a monthly product than a weekly product. But either way, um, the, the, you can go get the free trial or you can just sign up. But if you've got any questions about that, if you want any further information, feel free to drop me a message. I'm always happy to talk about it. But for now, and for the last time this season, I'm just going to say... Remember, if you're not enjoying your job, you're not doing it right. The Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook. Talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them.